Yo, 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 what's going on world? This is your boy Najee from rapradar.com. And today, man, I got a very special guest, man. Seated to my left. If you're watching this on YouTube, you watch hip hop interviews, you undoubtedly know who this guy is. I got my man Adam22, Mr. No Jumper. Nice to see you, G. What's up, brother? How, How are you, you man? Great. Man, I'm glad we finally got a chance to fucking meet. Me too, man. Ro rolling loud this past weekend, all the fucking craziness and shit. It's nice to see uh, New York's version of a SoundCloud rap festival, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yo, <laughs> the first thing about well, Rolling Loud, I was upset that the whole NYPD took out. That shit's sad. All the fucking took out Casanova, 2-2-G's, mm. Chef G. I bet ABG Neal is mad that he didn't get caught up, though. <laughs> yeah. like I'm in the gang, too. <laughs> he didn't get every movie. He's like, hey, man, I'm in I'm the, in the gang. gang, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that shit is crazy. But how do you think, like, they motherfuckers, like, pick and choose who the fuck is in like, who do we take out? There's a lot of gang members on this fucking flyer. I think it was like, they said that everybody who got removed from it had a violent incident in recent memory, which a couple other people on the list, I can kind of remember seeing it, like seeing it reported on or whatever, but most of them, I don't really remember hearing anything about them. Like Don Q? There's, Don, Don Q, Q is fucking relaxing. I think that, he, I remember though, he had something where he smacked somebody up or something, you know, and the, the cops are just looking for it. You're right, he's like one of the only ones that's not a Brooklyn guy that they removed yeah, from Don is, he don't even live in New York anymore. Yeah. Don be in Atlanta doing his own thing, so. I mean, you know what it is though? It's like the NYPD is such a bunch of fucking bullies and they just have to like do something to just be just like, to, hey, look, we can fuck with you. Yeah. Be careful. We something. will fuck your whole shit up. Just so you know, that mm. sounds really fucking you know so slavey i don't like like you know they just want to remind you like yeah we're letting you do this yeah. and if we want to take some people off the fucking lineup we're gonna do it what you think about the the last was it earlier this year rolling loud um where it was like everyone was getting fucking locked up that yeah. shit felt like a sting operation that was crazy it was just like bad energy in the air or something because most rolling louds nothing bad happens it's pretty chill that one in Miami, like a dude, hella bands that we know who used to come through the store all the time and shit. And yeah. he was like down with Glow Gang and all them. He got shot and killed at a club. Um, the whole situation with T Grizzly and like there was a shooting and there was like yep. a bunch of like Wayne got caught up, didn't play because they were trying to search his thing. I think some other people got caught with guns. Kodak, I think, got caught with a gun or something. Young boy got locked up. But, but then, that. Right, that, then right after they do the Bay Area one, Nothing. It's clean. <laughs> totally nothing. The most <laughs> right. viral thing was Brittany Renner talking to Megan Thee Stallion and saying bitch, bitch. a bunch of times. <laughs> right, 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 right. And then this one, to be honest, was, was all good besides them removing those five people, which was kind of like preemptive. They didn't, it's nothing happened at the fest. It just cops fucking with people before the fest. Do you have any moments in this one in particular that you fucked with or anything that kind of like stood out to you just about the weekend? Yeah, we somehow managed to scheme our way on stage with Uzi. And that was, oh, that was amazing just to like see greatness i never seen him that up close and personal doing his thing like yeah. it's, it's, honestly it's crazy because some of his songs are so big that you almost like forget they're his songs so that was for me as a massive uzi fan like i seen him play in a, in a venue in a warehouse in la like four or five years ago the footage is on no jumper and that shit was like not great yeah so it was wild to see him do sixty thousand or whatever that was yeah that's that's fucking crazy it was a lot of people at uzi set man um I know, obviously, like, we talking, like, just rolling loud. Um, I always think of, like, XXX is synonymous with rolling loud to me. Like, yeah. I always remember that iconic picture. He has the two braids, and he's, like, mm. fucking standing in the, like, the pit. And, um, demon. Yeah, the demon. Exactly, <laughs> the demon po photo. I always think of that photo when I think of rolling loud. And, you know, yeah. you and X obviously had, like, a crazy tight history. And um, would you say that episode blew you up, kind of, or whatever the fuck blow up means? Yeah, because to be honest, that was when I first really had industry people start hitting me up, where all of a sudden it's like so-and-so from Interscope wants to talk to you, and so-and-so from all these different labels, you know? So to be real, like, that was... It, it was crazy because he's in jail when that happened and all of a sudden like Rocky's manager wants to talk to me and all these people that I never had any reason to like ever have a conversation with and I'm like trying to figure out how I can somehow turn this energy into people letting me interview him and shit, you know? Right, right. So, I mean, yeah, that was like, and he knew it too. Like even when he did the interview, it's like I very much got the vibe that he knew that he was giving me a gift. 
And wow. even, you know, he kept doing that too. Like when we were on the phone while he was in jail, he's like, go, go on Twitter right now and say that you're my manager. I'll have my person who has my password retweet. Oh, so that was a troll, that fucking yeah, manager shit. You know, it's like, I think he kind of wanted me to be his manager, but at the same time, he kind of doubted my ability to deal with his bullshit, which is 100% <laughs> what the situation was, because I'm yeah. just not like a babysitter. Right. And to be a manager, that's really kind of the whole job. So, you know, but I mean, we had like a really good friendship. If we, if I had tried to manage them, we, we definitely would not have had as good a friendship for sure. Did you ever like con seriously contemplate it? Like, damn, I should try to fucking manage this kid. Yeah, I think I kind of underestimated like how much you need to talk to somebody when they're a uh, up and coming rapper who's locked up, you yeah. know, like I just kind of didn't give it the nurture that it would need. I don't know if that happened like, today, if I would like be Like visits able, and writing. You know, all that yeah, because like if you look at my man, Orlando Wartenberg is the one who signed him. Shout and like, why did he sign him? Because he was already going to that prison to see Kodak. And he just figured, oh, I'll go see X too. Right. And X very much at that time was like looking for like sort of like strong male leadership, you know, because he didn't really have a dad and like yeah. he sort of wanted like a, a somebody to help guide him. And like when I look at X's story, there's like a lot of different people who sort of like inserted themselves into the whole thing. Like like even his first manager, Bruno, who's like a porn star, like he, he and, and he does this like crazy ass porn website out of Florida. But like all these SoundCloud rappers would be at parties at his house and stuff. And that was oh, like I did X's hear that. first he used manager. To stay there, right? They used yeah, to live yeah. there. Yeah. I've been to some wild parties there too, but he, uh, yeah, like X just always kind of had these different figures in his life like that. That's fire. Did you know, like, at the time that he would be this fucking polarizing figure like that? I didn't know. When I did the interview, I didn't really know anything except that I just liked some of his songs on SoundCloud and that there was a ton of comments telling me to fuck with him. Yeah. And I had been fucking with a few different rappers from Florida that were sort of from the same scene, like Puya and... Yeah. Like a lot of like, you know, Rob Banks, all these kind of guys are kind of from the same scene. So I was just like interested in meeting him because he knew a lot of the same people as me. And he was just hitting me up saying he was a fan and getting hella likes on Twitter and shit. Because his fan base, like early on, he might have only had 16,000 followers, I think I said in the interview. Yeah. But like the, the, the engagement was like insane. And it was like clear to me that it wasn't faked. And I just kept listening to it and just thinking that there was something special about him. So I knew there was something special, but I mean, to be real, there's a lot of rappers that I see something special in, but then that doesn't translate over into the rest of the world thinking that they're special. <laughs> just you and the homies, just like, dudes, shit's fire. You know, like, I listen to Z Money, and I fucking love Z Money, and I think Z Money got one of the best flows in the game and stuff, but, yeah. like, Z Money, I don't know that, like, the average, like, 16-year-old kid in camo pink pants is going to want to listen to him. <laughs> right. But X, X, X had that market down. <laughs> How did y'all become friends like that, though? Like, I mean, I guess, I don't want to say, like, you would think you guys are from opposite worlds but it just mm. seemed like y'all were so like just super tight and like where you think the chemistry kind of came from like I mean he was just real smart and he was just the type of dude who would just FaceTime you and just want to talk and just I don't know he was just like a deep kid and I would just I was just interested enough in him that I would do these long ass calls with him which I would like never do for any other rapper because I'm just like way too busy and doing my own shit so like really Sit on, on FaceTime. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. If, a, if a rapper right. FaceTimes me, I'm gonna talk to him for five minutes or some shit, and then be like, right, I gotta go. Yeah. But I was just having these stupid long conversations with him and stuff, and we just kind of became bros like that, you know? Right, right. That's why. I mean, you've had a lot of episodes just kind of go <laughs> viral. I'm gonna say kind of actually go viral. Mm. Um, I want to talk about just the the virality aspect of it. I don't know if that's like a word or whatever, but sound yeah, sound fire. Yeah, yeah All virality. Right. All right. Uh, when you're talking about like viral content, is it something that do you know automatically like, oh shit, this is fucking viral? Mm. Or like, are you going for that? Like, are you going for viral? I feel like I can kind of, I can gauge how well an interview is going to do by the end of the interview for sure, because I just know what parts of the interview are the most interesting. As and in clickbait type shit? Or yeah, just... like I can just hear it happening in my head because I just know that like, you know, when I'm interviewing Dame Dash, and a lot of times you can just see me looking dumbfounded <laughs> as fuck, because when Dame Dash is all of a sudden just saying Jay-Z ain't shit, and you see my eyes like, whoa? Right. Like, that's right. me thinking like, whoa, that's a moment. like that wasn't supposed to happen. Like, you're really gonna make this go viral, huh? And I mean, that happens all the time. But yeah, I mean, I, like, I guess that's just sort of part of doing an interview is you want to figure out what the shit people want to hear about is. Like when I was getting ready to do that Dame Dash interview, I remember I just sat there and I was like, all right, so what do people want to hear Dame Dash talk about? And I'm like, well, 
There's that NFL shit. Yeah, that shit was hot. And there's Jay Z yeah. and oh yeah, Jay Z and Dame Dash. That makes sense. He might have an opinion about that. Okay. But you know he hates you know? the Jay Z questions. Like, do you ever get like hesitant to bring up shit when you mm. know it's like he spazzed on people in the past for yeah. asking about well, Jay? That's how I was figuring that I was I was trying to figure out how to work my way into getting him comfortable enough <laughs> to, to be able to just be honest, you know? So I right. forget like exactly what I was talking about before the NFL shit, but I figured that talking about the NFL shit was gonna be easy to segue into because Dame gives a fuck about politics and gives a fuck about, you know, black rights and all this shit. So yeah. it's like, uh, we're probably going to end up talking about that. So it's easy to start talking about the NFL and like, you know, corporate deals with them and stuff. Cause he's somebody who's been kind of burnt by corporate America. For sure. Like you know? black bold and So I figured he would have an opinion on it one way or another. I didn't know that he would be so direct about his thoughts on Jay-Z's involvement, you know? Right. I didn't think so either. No, that was shocking. He never, t and, and, and it's funny cause like, I'm listening to Joe Budden talk about it and Joe Budden's like, how the hell are you putting this on Adam? Like, he just met you. <laughs> and right. that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, right. I just met he this He was guy. waiting to, like, tell that to somebody. I yeah. feel like he just had that just you know, ready to fucking say Because if, if Dame Dash had gone on Joe Budden's podcast and said that, okay, whatever. It would make sense because it's like he's probably known he Joe, Joe like, for a long time. And so right. he's meeting me. And I'm just like, Dame Dash feels like a fucking uncle to me because I was such a Rockefeller stan my whole life. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he's just hitting me with this shit, basically telling them my other uncle's a fucking asshole. Right. And I'm like, damn, like, that's crazy. No, that was crazy. It was a dope ass interview. I mean, did you, I mean, obviously, like, Dame Dash, if we're Appreciate talking that. about just like uh, culture and things, like, he, he's always been high and vocal on culture vulture. Like, I, mm. I feel like he started the term, I think. I feel like. Um, did you know that like that was gonna come up just because that's been a part of his like yeah. spiel? Yeah, I mean, I figured that he would say something about it, and my my opinion, like whenever people say shit about that, is just kind of like I just always wanted to make content with people that I was interested in, and like some large percentage of those people end up being black. Sometimes yeah. I look at like the row of interviews I've just done, and I'm like, holy shit, I just did like 15 black dudes in a row. Like I probably kind of look like I'm fucking sucking up right here because like, <laughs> why, a lot of why am I not interviewing more white dudes? But yeah. you know, so I mean that, that, I know that that's like a super boring answer that is totally not going to be satisfactory to somebody who's like hella far gone on the social justice warrior shit. Yeah. But that is honestly just how I look at it is I'm just doing content about shit that I'm interested in with people who are willing to sit down with me. So it's like if, if you feel like I'm taking more than I'm giving to black people or whatever, then I understand. I'm willing to listen to like critiques and stuff. And I feel like my interview style has been fully like informed by the shit that people have talked about me because I mean, you know, to a certain extent, it's like I can't like I've heard a lot of people be critical about me just talking too casually about drugs with young people in particular. Yeah. So, you know, I'm conscious of that and definitely try to, you know, I, like an example of people changing over time, even like outside of me. And I'd say it happened to me, too, like academics early on was hella reckless with the way he would talk about like violence between with the Chicago shit. You yeah. know, he was reckless yeah. with that shit. I yeah. don't think he was as bad as some people make it out to be, but he was definitely saying some crazy shit at times. And I definitely feel like he talks about it in a more measured tone, you know, and I would say the same thing myself. Like anytime I ever was like maybe a little too jolly and talking about somebody getting shot at or something, you know, yeah. and then had people be like, oh, that's fucked up for you to fucking talk about it like that. You know, I can't help but like remember that and think about it the next time I talk about it. I'm not acting like I'm perfect, you know? Yeah. It's, it's just a weird fucking slippery slope <laughs> talking about culture vulture, right? Like, mm -hmm. if, the de like if the definition is, right, like, you you take without giving back. Mm. Um, th that's kind of how I perceive it to be. But then I feel like there are a lot of people doing that. But I think the term culture vulture kind of like when we're talking about connotation, people mostly think of it like white people. Mm. But I don't know if it's just relegated to like just one color. Like I feel like black people could be culture vultures too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I could see that that being said too. But I mean, like the thing for me is just kind of like I don't think the average black person really doesn't want white people to be involved in hip hop at all because I can think of a ton of white people that are like beloved in hip hop. Like, yeah. you know, like people definitely catch feelings when a white person in hip hop seems like they're doing some sketchy shit that maybe a black person would get more of the benefit of the doubt on. But I mean, I'm not really like mad at anybody who's critical of like what I'm doing or what Vlad's doing or whatever. It's like, you, like we deserve to be discussed and critiqued just like anybody else. And my attitude isn't like, oh, don't talk about me. My attitude is kind of just like, whatever, I don't fucking care. Yeah. Like I'll listen to it and be interested in 
the criticism, but I mean. See, but Vlad is a little bit different to me, though. And I, I've never met Vlad. I don't, I don't know Vlad. He just got better titles than everybody else. <laughs> he does <laughs> click make the shit out the titles. But I mean, like, I think, I think about it when it's like, I feel like there were a couple different instances where some of his content, if not directly mm. made people catch cases, but like are used in cases. And it just feels like when you're monetizing street shit, mm. You gotta be careful with, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, yeah. you gotta be a little walking that thin line. You know it's what I'm saying? It's definitely a thin line. But at the same time, it's kind of like, I think one thing that kind of always comes back to me is like, half the time I'm asking somebody about some drama or whatever, it's already drama that they willingly put on social media. Sure. So it's not like I'm saying like, because there's a lot of fights and a lot of drama and a lot of people who have been <laughs> shot at and all kinds of shit that I yeah. know about that I'm not gonna go bring it up on a podcast because it's not public record. And it's like, if I thought that they wanted to talk about it, I'd bring it up, but I'm not like trying to break open shit that's already, you know, but if you talked about it on your Instagram live and there's a clip on Instagram live of you talking about somebody shooting at you yeah. and it's got half a million views, then I don't really see the issue with <laughs> Would me you bring asking it up? you about that clip, you know? I mean, But it's I also you... well within your right to just say, hey, no, nah, I ain't talking about it. You know, that happens all the time. And I'm I cool think that, that too. And I feel like, but that's what Vlad says is like, yo, bro, you don't have to answer the question. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these kids are just so fucking happy to mm -hmm. be on TV and it just feels like, these are just young black kids trying to get a mm. moment, so they talking street shit that they know. Yeah. And it just gets a little, a little weird. No, yeah. It's you know definitely it's a slippery slope for sure. Nah, for sure. Oh, yeah, let's go. Oh, shout yeah. out to my man, Black Dave, passing me this, uh, this here spliff that we just rolled. You know what I'm saying? Get right, cigar talk. <clears throat> but nah, I think um, just kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, I thought it was dope. This shit was like maybe a couple weeks ago. There was a, like a viral meme that started, I don't know who the fuck started it. It was like, who's the top five interviewers in the game? I saw that and I saw you on it. I was, and I was like, I was okay, happy. he's in the game. You know what I'm saying? In that little grid. I'm like, God talk is out this bitch. You know what I'm saying? I was tight. I was happy as fuck. There was people hating, I seen a couple sub tweets, you know what I mean? I see Vlad like, not happy that he wasn't on it. Hell yeah. Well, what did you, all right, first of all, is like, one, I do feel like, like as far as like the new guys, I feel like I should be on there. But like when you're talking top five, do you have like a top five or just like shit that you, you fuck with as far as interviewers other than yourself? I mean, I'm a Joe Budden fan. Like, I just feel like you need to have your podcast that you listen to. And like, the more you listen to that individual podcast, the more you're going to get from it. So it's like, I don't skip around and listen to a lot of different people's podcasts unless yeah. it's like I'm getting ready for an interview. You know, like I just got on Dan Lathan shit. I just started watching oh, some the Red of Pill shit. shit? Yeah, 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 because I, I listened to him interview. Uh, I forget. But, uh, you know, I, I listened to him interview somebody. So uh, Mandy from Horrible Decisions. Oh, okay. So yeah. I listened to his shit because of that and because I was interviewing him and then that kind of got me on the Van Lathan wave. But for the most part, I listen to Joe Budden's shit. I watch Breakfast Club. Um, it's nice to be included in the conversation. I'm not tripping about trying to be number one or whatever. It's nice to be included in the conversation. I'm not like, I'm better than <laughs> Charlemagne. You know, yeah. Charlemagne put in way more work and had way more viral shit happen and all kinds of shit. So it's like, if somebody wants to say I'm their favorite, it's lit, but I'm not. You don't, you don't care about that, like it's like being the best or like just rankings in, t in terms of like, like cultural ranking. No, I mean, I'm definitely concerned with just doing the best shit that I can and doing the most that I can. Yeah. But at the end of the day, and yeah, once in a while, it definitely will kind of hurt. Like I did the Glasses Malone interview and got like 40,000 views and the Breakfast Club did it and they got a million views. I'm like, damn, like right. my audience do not want to hear the... some grown ass shit about <laughs> Tupac or whatever about right. a motherfucker dissing Tupac. <laughs> You know, sometimes I'll be looking at it like, damn, like I took an L on that. But it's not like I'm, I'm not tripping. I feel like it's great to see like more and more people get into the game and shit. So I'm not, I feel like everybody just kind of benefits from building up the overall YouTube ecosphere of hip hop related content, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's just dope. Like everyone kind of has their own lane and audience, right? Like, like you said, like you, your audience ain't really fucking with Glasses Malone, right? Apparently my audience didn't want to hear about him talking shit about Tupac in a song, which is interesting to me because I feel like a lot of times, like I just did Spider Loke and he's talking shit about 50 and Young Buck and shit, and that shit still did pretty good. Yeah, you know, I feel like anybody talking shit will it will go good. <laughs> yeah, will go. Do you think? How did you get so fucking just entrenched in the SoundCloud shit though, bro? Because it's like, I think you're in your 30s, like, I mean, I get you. I know you came from the BMX world. Yo, it's just like, how the fuck did you even? 
really get into that like i mean like specifically it really was just because of the fact that i was friends with this dude xavier wolf yeah who basically yeah he's he's lit he's a dope ass music and shit and he was so basically he's one of the early yeah he was yeah. my first rapper i ever interviewed and oh. he, my first rapper i ever knew first rapper i ever had on my phone so it's like he he did my first ever rapper interview and he was basically like space ghost perp one of the dudes in his crew you know and then he had his own movement going on after that and then like Puya hit me up, who's like another Florida rapper that was kind of like that early SoundCloud era. And he was like, yo, I saw that Xavier interview. I thought it was tight. I want you to do my first interview. And then like that just sort of led to like all of a sudden I'm doing like Wi-Fi's funeral and like Rob Banks and all these other yeah. dudes from Florida. And then all of a sudden that leads into like X and Lil Pump and Smoke Perp. And then those dudes all blow the fuck up past like mad people. But meanwhile, I just got a bike shop that sells clothes and you can hang out and smoke weed there and shit. And like, <laughs> right, so right. all these dudes live downtown LA and shit, or at least are there all the time. So people are popping by all the time. You know, there's like Pulling a, up, there's a photo of Playboy Cardi just on somebody's bike that he borrowed. And he just pulled up to the, to the shop and just said hi while I was doing another interview. At what point of Playboy Cardi was this? It was very early Playboy Cardi, but uh, it, it still was like, holy shit, that's Playboy Cardi, at least yeah. to me. I don't know how, sure. how, how many numbers he was doing at the time. Now, was, were you like, when you're hearing about all these people just because of like getting in that world and doing Xavier Wolf and shit, is it like, are you hearing about them on some like, you listening to the music type shit? You hearing about it in yeah. the music? Or is it just mostly like people are hitting you like, yo, fuck with this person, interview this person? You know, yeah, it started to become that where it's like all of a sudden people are putting me on and telling me about more shit. And it, but I mean, for me, it's like, that just led me to getting into way more rap that was even way outside of that zone of SoundCloud rap where all of a sudden I'm fucking with all these Chicago rappers and Atlanta dudes and stuff. And to me, I'm just like stupid geeked over this because right. to me, I'm like a fucking Gucci man stan my whole life. And like, you know, I wasn't, I was never the type of person, not my whole life, but like, you know, since he came out like 2007 yeah. or whatever, I was just like stupid into Gucci and G-Unit and Dipset and stuff. And I was always the kind of person that I didn't really just want to do the the Cameron like listen to Cameron I want to listen to Hellrell and J.R. Ryder and Freaky and all these other dudes and just like and co like cover the whole thing because I yeah. feel like sometimes you get real as shit from the dudes who are like less known in the crew and shit so right. when it came time when I started to use that SoundCloud clout to like get you know the other the, the bigger dude or like LA gangster rapper dudes that I grew up listening to that I'm like holy shit I like Master P you know Ghostface yeah. not that they're LA gangster rappers but you know just all these legends and shit yeah. you know do you think, is it like, do they respect you the same way? Like, I, I saw you had like Usher on your shit before. Was it Usher and Zaytoven, I think? <coughs> I mean, sometimes, like, sometimes it's obvious, like, doing an Usher interview. I feel like Usher, you know, he just had a project out. The label probably told him, like, yo, this is a good look. This will help you get <laughs> right. through to a younger audience. But I feel like the audiences are just so fucking yeah. different. I mean, because, like, is my audience really that interested in Usher? I don't know. But for me, it's dope because, for me, I just want to talk to Usher. I think it's cool as fuck. I got <laughs> right, to talk to Usher. Sure. So it's like, oh, you're yeah. trying to use me because I got a younger audience, then cool. Like, let's do it. Did you kind of, was it like a more strategic play? Like, you knew, like, yo, this is a lane that's fucking untapped, and I'm going to go for this? Or was it just like, that's just kind of how it happened? Yeah, at that time, because now I feel like there's no shortage of people doing interviews with all kinds of like underground rappers and everybody sees the value in getting content with all these up and coming artists early on. Everybody understands the value in that now. Yeah. Early on, I didn't even really understand it. Like when I did that Xavier interview, I remember just tripping because it had like 50,000 views in like a couple weeks. And I'm just like, I had never done that many views before because before I was just doing BMX interviews, you know, and like a BMX interview was like viral to me if it had like 15 or 20,000 or something, you know? <laughs> right. so. To me, personal that, virals. You know, it's like it's very like there's a lot of different levels to this shit. Viral like, to me, motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's just kind of like I just sort of like stumbled onto it, and now it's like interesting to see like big companies that are owned by like big ass fucking companies, and they're like basically competing with me for the same fucking interviews with these same dudes that were like unknown three weeks ago. For sure, for sure. I mean, if, if we're just talking about kind of like, I guess you're sort of clairvoyant in that space, just being able to see that as being a lane that was untapped. If we're talking about the the next wave of shit, what does that look like to you? Damn, that's interesting. I mean, it's always like hard to think about who will pop off exactly out of uh, out of like a crop of rappers. Like, 
Like, what is it about Polo G that made him blow the fuck up past a ton of other rappers who realistically are kind of doing, like, a similar style, you know? Because I did his interview, like, real early on, and I thought he was tight, but yeah. I definitely didn't understand that he was going to blow up the How way How long ago was it? did you do that? Shit, that was probably almost a year, maybe, like, eight months ago or something. Okay. But, I mean, you know, I, like, I knew he was dope, and I was like, I'm looking at the songs, and they're fire, you know, but at the same time, like, you don't know that he's going to keep making heat. Yeah. You don't know that he's going to fucking really connect with the fans, like, the way I've seen him connect with the fans, and even on, like, shit, like, I mean, there's some dudes that it's just so obvious. Like, the day I met Juice World, I was like, I'm, you know. Oh, you knew? There's like, no way knew? that this dude is not going to blow the fuck up. How, what was it about him? Like, he was just, like, unbelievable musically. He had, like, you know, he was just freestyling, going crazy. He was super nice and fun to talk to. Yeah. And it was, like, it, that was that was one that tripped me out because I had every different A&R that I talked to mention Juice World to me at the same time. And when I went to meet up with him, he met up with me at my store, but Dante Ross is there, too. Oh, shit. And then I realized, like, oh, Dante Ross is an a and he's here yeah. talking to him about that shit, too. And then Cole Bennett comes to the store later that day, Damn. and I say to Cole, Cole Bennett, I go, Yo, you seen this Juice World kid? He goes, I'm doing this video, his first video next week. Damn. And I'm like, oh, so it's, it's all over. Happening. It's, it's all over. over. It's all the way over. He's now. gone. Yeah. 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 Cole got the fucking secret sauce, bro. What the fuck is that? Like, if we're talking about viral shit, he popped up Lil Tekka to me. He's one that I, I, like, you know, I knew he was sick. I thought he was so dope. Because I remember there was a night where I did a famous Dex interview and a Cole Bennett interview. And there's like different, then this is like hella years ago. So it's like different levels of anxiety about doing this shit. Yeah. And for Cole Bennett, I was like, whatever. I had met him. I thought he was cool. He had a little buzz going with like a couple hundred thousand subscribers or whatever. I wasn't nervous at his, about his interview. Yeah. I was nervous about Dex because Dex, I had to ask him about beating up his girlfriend and all this shit, you know? Right. And then like, look at how fucking shit changes. Dex, he's, he's doing what he's doing. But meanwhile, Cole Bennett got 11 million subscribers. <laughs> And has everybody in the fucking game on his dick, like, right. killing it. Right. It's fucking absolutely crazy, man. I mean, when we're talking about guys, like, I, I interviewed Polo G2, and um, this was, like, earlier this year. And, um, you know, I kind of <coughs> knew, this is, like, right, right around the album. I'm like, fuck, this album is fucking fire. But I feel like, you can let me know what you think, like, now, it's not just the music part. I feel like the real life part is kind of what's blowing these kids up, and if the music can corroborate what the real life shit is, mm. then it's like... But Polo G ain't like super wrapped up in some shit. He, like, he don't got cases and shit, right? He got a couple he? cases. Yeah, he, oh, a, he got a couple cases. He's not as out there as the rest of them talk, but it just feels like that's kind of where yeah. shit is. Sometimes, because some rappers really like ain't getting by on much besides credibility, you know? Like For some sure. dudes, I've seen rappers, and I'm not gonna throw names out there, but I've seen rappers get punched in the face and their fucking career's over the next day because they just, their whole image was being untouchable, tough guy, whatever. And then yeah. when all these kids realize that you don't really roll around like that and that you actually are kind of a bitch, then it's, it's <laughs> yeah, sort of over. Yeah. But there's a lot of rappers like, bro, I seen X get knocked out on stage in front of a fucking whole that. audience yeah. and nobody gave a fuck. It didn't hurt him at all. It probably made him bigger because nobody was looking at him like he's supposed to be a tough guy. Yeah. They're looking at him like he's kind of crazy, but they're not looking at him like he's supposed to be Mr. Gangster. Right. So he was able to do that and skate. Nobody gave a fuck. There's other people who got jumped one time and it's over because they sort of had to live up to that image, you know? I mean, but we had an interesting point right now because obviously this fucking 6 9 news has been everywhere. Everybody's talking about it. Every media outlet has to cover it. <coughs> Real talk. That's the guy that's like, if we're talking about like people getting exposed for lifestyle not being what you're saying, that's like the epitome of it, right? Right. But like, <coughs> I'm having conversations with everybody on and off air. And everybody sort of, the consensus is, is he's going to be able to come back and still fucking do what he was doing. Yeah, because, I mean, there's always going to be a percentage of the audience who doesn't care about what, like, the traditional hip-hop guys care about, you know? So it's like, I mean, we live in a world where you can just have your own fan base. I mean, I'm interested to see just what level he's able to get to without the sort of, like, the hardcore yeah. hip-hop fans. The thing about 6 9 is I think he's smart enough to figure out a direction that he can go in. Like, I don't know if he's planning on coming out and talking all gangster and shit, but it seems kind of misguided to me. If I were him, I'd probably try to go in like a more lighthearted direction, especially since he has done that. Isn't it too late though? It's like, <laughs> dude, we already saw you being this fucking 
telling the world suck your dick. Mm. You fucking, you know, doing X, Y, and Z, putting hits on people, doing that, you know, and then it's just like. But this is the thing is that at the very least, when he gets out, everybody's going to be fiending for anything possible for, from him. Yeah. I'm sure the that. first song is going to go bananas. Yeah, whatever it's he puts the, out is going to go crazy. 100%. The question is, is like, does he moment and then sort of just settle into being like a mediocre, different rapper that hip hop never really gets behind? Or is he smart enough that he can actually keep it going? I haven't seen any sign that points towards him not being able to continue to orchestrate this career. Hmm. You know, like he's been doing it since day one, even before people noticed he was doing all kinds of crazy viral attention getting shit. And like, given that he has all the resources that he has now, I mean, I I feel like he's just going to figure it out one way or another. What do you think your audience like (coughs) as as far as your audience, if we're talking about because we're talking like, you know, like snitching is not the same, right? Like people these days, they don't really care about snitching the same way as like yesteryear, right? Mm. Or street guys. If the today's generation, if Generation Z, if they don't care about like snitching, if that's not enough to say, yo, we don't fuck with this guy, mm. what do you, do you think there is something today that's like, if you do this, you're out? Or is it just a free for all? Like you can do whatever the fuck you want and people just fuck with it. Man. I don't know, because it doesn't seem like deviant behavior ever really hurts anybody's career like that bad. I mean, if you really have like a viral wave going, you know, like I can point to like rappers that have like got into some shit where they did something that was fucked up and then their career kind of fell off. But usually it was a case where they were probably going to fall off anyway. So I don't know. I mean, definitely the, the thing about 6 9 is that, like, yeah, snitching is, like, one of the worst things that you could do, especially on such a scale that he did. Yeah. But I just don't think that that's really going to outweigh the level of star that he basically is and became during his time. But a lot of guys, like, you'll see them and they have, like, a little tiny wave going where they get a couple million plays on a song and then they do something that's way less, like, devastating than snitching like they just get beat up or get the chain snatched or whatever and then the career is over but they were never really that hot to begin with 6ix9ine really is like disgustingly ridiculously popular and it's just kind of like but but then again audiences do move on super fast but you just never really see it coming it's like seeing a company on the stock market that absolutely just crashes and burns you don't really see it coming until right. it happens and then once it happens it's like oh yeah of course we knew that, we, was, of gonna course we all knew that yeah. was gonna happen <laughs> right. so with 6ix9ine if it's like I can imagine a scenario in which he's just a pretty like mid ass like rapper that nobody really cares that much about in like three years. Yeah. I think he's definitely got a couple of years of people hanging on his every word for sure. Just given like in a lot of ways, this whole situation has just made the story more interesting. Just like the whole all the snitching, all the extra shit. Yeah. On it. And if he overcomes it, then that's even more fascinating. You know, it's like it's crazy to even think about like him overcoming. Obviously, like, you know, us kind of being in the media space and um, academics you know was a like a large part of that fucking story like in terms mm. of just covering shit um do you what do you think of that just that partnership side of shit like with with Atkins 69 I know that is a crazy thing because it's like I've always resisted getting too in bed with any of the artists that I deal with even the ones that I'm super good friends with like you know, when I became really good friends with X and he asked me to be his manager or whatever, it's like I never really jumped on that opportunity the way that I could have. Or it's like I'm friends with Pump or I'm friends with 6 9 but I just never wanted to be the dude that's like trying to go over their crib every day to kick it with them. Yeah. But like in reality, being friends with rappers is fucking whack <laughs> because <laughs> in reality, they're busy as fuck, especially like popping rappers. Like, you know, yeah. I'm friends with fucking Juice World, but I just don't want to go chill with Juice World when he's not when we're not making content together or whatever, because it's like, I have shit to do every single day and I want to be busy and I want to be working on myself. Like, I I just couldn't imagine myself, like I'm friends with Lil Yachty, but I couldn't imagine myself just, hey Yachty, yo, let's just kick it. (laughs) Like, that's just, I just don't, I don't move at that speed. So like a lot of people are like on that. And like, but but for me, for academics, I mean, I feel like he's probably, he's pretty much like that for the most part. Like he's, somebody that you don't see him kicking it with a whole bunch of rappers or whatever, but him and 6 9 had, like, an actual friendship. Yeah. I don't really blame him. Like, he was getting content that was going absolutely insane every time he hung out with 6 9 Sure. But, I mean, I, I understand the argument that 6 9 like, like, academics got too in bed with him in the sense that, like, maybe to a certain extent, academics' brand is kind of, like, permanently married to, to, to 6 9 I feel nine. like it is to me. You yeah. know, and it's like 6 9 being as popping as he is, that's all good. But... 
if his career goes in like a really bad direction, which you would think that the snitching thing is, yeah. but apparently not, <laughs> because apparently everybody seems to agree that his career is going to be fine. Yeah. Uh, that could potentially be bad for academics, but in reality, I don't think it's actually bad for academics. I feel like the audience just moves on and doesn't really fucking pay that much attention. Yo, act takes a lot of fucking heat, just mm. like in the media space, and I feel like a lot rightfully deserved. I feel like he's, he'd be saying a lot, he says a lot of wild shit, um, and like, I guess if we kind of, if we're talking about like just that whole vulture aspect of it, where it's just like throwing so much negativity without highlighting a lot of the positivity kind of makes it feel like that. You think like the heat on academics is, is deserved? I mean, I feel like academics knows what he's doing, that he's sort of made himself synonymous with gossip and drama and breaking news and rap for better or for worse. Like, I look at TMZ, and I think that what TMZ does is amazing, and really, they actually act with, like, a code of ethics in yeah. terms of, like, verifying everything that they publish right. to the point where I really respect what they're doing. But, I mean, TMZ can't help the fact that they're synonymous with gossip and drama because they're so good at breaking those stories. You got to take your hat off to academics because he's just so good at covering the breaking news and, like, getting that shit out there and having built this audience that it just is what it is. Like, you know, I, 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 I can't really hate on it because the truth is is that... There's just an appetite for that shit. And his whole career, he's just been following the views. Like, he does big but mainstream stories But that's what's the problem, now. though. But that's the shit is, like, you can't, if, you following the views at the expense of what, though? Mm. Right? Like, at the expense of these fucking kids' mm. lives that are really in the field shooting. I watched a Rico Reckless interview where he was saying that, like, yo, people are really mm. dying in Chicago. But academics, too, like, you could say that there's been growth because he doesn't do that kind of shit anymore. Like, he doesn't do, do like stories about like lesser known dudes shooting at each other and shit even though in reality it's like there are dudes on Still youtube who do those stories about these super irrelevant rappers who are just in gangs and shooting at each other and all kinds of shit like academics did do that shit but you know it's like i i feel like you could forgive somebody for how they get how they got on in the first place if it's a little problematic because he's moved in a, a different direction you know yeah, I mean, he still be doing some fuck shit, though. The Yes Jules little beef they had, that I was like kind of... That. That you was into that? I mean, I like seeing... I saw the Spider-Man meme where they were, like, pointing at each other. That's <laughs> fucking hilarious. I like that because that's just, like, that's just such an obvious one that academics is going to win. Because when people go at each other on Twitter, it's about who's the most likable. And academics, right. like, realistically probably doesn't want to be beefing with, like, a lot of people on Twitter because they're going to get more retweets and, and likes than him. Yeah. But him and Yes Jules, I'm like, oh, nah, you got this, bro. <laughs> but he, I, I just feel like Act gets tough a lot with, with women. Like, he's a little mm. extra. Ugh. Like, you. <laughs> but you know what? This is what I will say, is that it's a certain thing that goes on. Like, all right, you remember when uh, MGK and Eminem were beefing? Yeah. And you had fucking Vince Staples on Twitter. And Vince Staples was doing, like, commentary, like, play-by-play. -play, sure. Laughing his ass off, dying about these white dudes beefing. Why? Because they're fucking white millionaires that aren't going to shoot each other, so you can just sit back and laugh at it. Right. A lot of shit, a lot of drama that I'm sure Vince Staples knows about, he don't tweet like that about it. Why? Because it's serious, because somebody could really get hurt. The sure. reason why you laugh and fucking at MGK versus Eminem is because you know nobody's going to get hurt, right. so you can just have a good time with it. It's kind of like That's that. It's a rap battle. It's like that when the girls fight, because it's like Cardi B and Nicki Minaj, of course we all got more to say about it, because we know they ain't going to shoot each other. When you're watching sense. a lot of these gangster rappers beef at the same, like when you were watching the Chief Keef and fucking YG and Six Nine shit, yeah, yeah, you were entertained and yeah, you were watching it, but at the same time you're thinking, holy Somebody fuck, this kid get, is gonna yeah, get smoked for sure. And then it's not gonna be funny. Then it's gonna be a sad story that we're all gonna be looking at, like, holy shit, I can't That's believe that point. just happened. You know? That's a fair point. But it, I feel like you do have you have to keep the same <laughs> energy though, right? right? Like the the idea that like if I want to be tough today, you got to be tough tomorrow. You can't really like mm. pick and choose like. All right, like let me pick her because she's not gonna do anything. So let yeah. me go. All, like I just said, like when Vic Mensa was like, "Yo, I think you're a bitch," and it was just like, in what sense, <laughs> right? But and that, like and that's. But, but what was he supposed to do? Is he supposed to fucking punch Vic Mensa in the face? Because <laughs> I just, like, no, he, you'll lose your job. People for that. been saying that to me about. I just did an Aaron Carter interview. And I he's, saw it. He's bugging, and like people are like, "Oh, I can't believe you didn't knock him out." I'm like. Rule number one of doing an interview is you're not allowed to punch the person you're interviewing. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. Like, no matter 100%. what somebody says to me in an interview, like yeah. if Vic Mensa was sitting across from me and Vic Mensa's like, I think you're a bitch, 
I would be like, all right, we could like fight later or some shit if you really want to get it in like that. But would that, you sure. just address it though? Like at least like that that can't really go unchecked though. I mean, if, if somebody's said, like, yo, I think you're a bitch. If you say you think you're a bitch, I would say why? Let's let's go talk. Well, that's what hit he me, said. He's like, me. in what sense, right? I mean, in what sense is an awkward thing to say there? But <laughs> I mean, sense? I feel like I would say like, Come all on, right, man. let's hear it. Let's go. Let's go. Because straight up, like I want to argue with people about sure. shit. But like saying you're a bitch is kind of like doesn't really mean anything on its own. You got to contextualize that. You got to tell me why nah. I'm a bitch. Yo, Adam, if we, like, at least, because I'm, I'm, and I'm from here, right? Like, mm. in a city where it's like, if somebody just comes into you like, yo, you're a bitch, mm. that's like, I want to fight. I want to take this to another level. That's what that means. So it's like, if you don't want to take it to another level, that's fine, right? Like, mm. I don't never get on people for not doing that. Mm. But it's just like, if you're not that guy, then just don't be that guy. But I feel like at this point in my life, if somebody came up to me on the street and said, you're a bitch, that I'm just gonna be like, ah, uh, like I'm, I'm not trying to fight somebody in public because there's so much bad shit that comes with that that I'm gonna have to deal with. Like sure. once that shit's on TMZ, it's not gonna matter that he called me a bitch. It's just gonna be the fact that I punched him. You know, six nine had the thing with the kid shoving the phone in his face and he, and he fucking grabbed, yeah. smashed the phone or whatever. It's right. like that shit is annoying as fuck that that kid did that. But at the end of the day, if you punch somebody and you're famous and you got money, it's like you're going to court. So it's like, if somebody walks up to me and says that, it's like, at a certain point, I just got to accept. But it's not just somebody. That's like, you're saying like a little fucking kid on the street, like, hey, Adam, you're a bitch. But I'm saying like an artist on your show, that's a little, that's kind of different. But I can't settle it with my hands. I got to just fucking argue. At least on camera, right there. Yeah, yeah, If if, if, the situation you're talking about, I don't even want to fucking fight. At all, yeah. I got no pride to save here. It's like, realistically, it's (laughs) like, I got homies you could fight if you really want to fight somebody. Probably one of them is down. They're like, literally right now, they're like, no, 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 we got this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I just don't think that I'm really in a position where I'm like, you got to accept at some point, like, all right, I'm a fucking stupid ass celebrity with a bunch of money now and I can't be fucking throwing hands. doing shit. Yeah. You know, it's like, you got to get over that hump at a certain point, you know? You would think. I mean, shit, Rocky's not, right? He's still like, going he to get active. Really, if, if it, he did try. He did try he to, tried like, to prevent He tried to prevent that shit like crazy, and that's the extra ass shit about why it was so fucking frustrating that he got caught up in that. Because Rocky, as an 18-year-old kid that wasn't famous yet, if he had some guy on the street in Harlem say, yo, like, bye, 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 get in his face or whatever, I'm sure he would have swung on him. Yeah. It's so like Rocky been rich and famous for a long time. He knows that he's got these big ass dudes with him to handle that shit, you know? Nah, that's true. For yeah. a fact. All right, um, just switching gears a little bit, man. I think another interesting part to me about just No Jumper and the whole Adam shit is, yo, you and Lena, man, mm. that dynamic is so <laughs> fucking, like, entertaining. Like, yeah, too. Um, me, me and my little main squeeze. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The dynamic is fucking interesting. I saw you guys at the Pornhub Awards. Mm. Um, what is that like, bro? Honestly, it doesn't bother me at all because, like, when I met her, we were both, like, super, like, ordinary types of people. Like, I mean, I had this, like, BMX website and everything, so I thought I was the shit. But basically, I was at the very, very early stages of doing No Jumper. So I was, like, I had a cool little podcast going on that, like, had a little wave going. But she, yeah. she was, like, an assistant at some fucking random ass social media type company and, like, making, like, two grand a month or some bullshit. So she was, like, not hyped on her life. So it's like, you know, we've been together over three years now, and it's like, really, like, we've seen everything together, like, ups and downs of, like, everything. So it's like, yeah. I don't know. Like, I told her, like, when we first started hanging out, I was like, she was thinking about doing the private Snapchat just because she was, like, she had, like, 50K on Instagram. Like, a lot of girls out there were probably thinking about getting into it, and everybody yeah. was just begging her to start doing the private snap, you know? Right. And I just told her, I'm like, let's get this money. Let's do it. Does that not bother you at all? Like, your girl Man. showing you t- her titties and shit like that, you're just like, meh. Let's get this bag. People always think that she's like a real porn star and she's fucking all these dudes and shit. She's never done anything with any dude besides me. So it's like, I'm not mad about somebody being able to pay her money to watch her eat some pussy or to watch her <laughs> suck my dick or whatever. It's like, yeah. if that's going to be the reason why me and her live in a nice house and fucking, well, I would like to say a nice car, but she got a fucking Civic still. But <laughs> she got plans to upgrade. Uh, you you got to upgrade them, bro. You got to upgrade She don't give a fuck. It's so bad, bro. I wish she had a nice car just because every once in a while I got to drive her car and I'm just driving in the LA Civic. Too? It's like such yeah. a throwback. I'm like, man, I remember this shit. This shit feels like it's going to blow away. You got to roll up the windows. Like, <laughs> roll up the windows. Nah, it's newer than that. <laughs> Don't let me see Lena rolled up the window oh in LA, bro. Yo, but no, nah, I think it's just fire because, like, yo, y'all publicly talk about, like, you have fem- female guests on there and you guys are, like, recruiting for threesomes. That shit's fucking fire, bro. There's a, there's a line there where I'm not trying to pressure anybody into fucking us on the podcast, but yeah, you know, we, we might bring well, it up once in a while. Well, you can't do it, but I feel like she's, like, mm. shooting shots. She's the Trojan horse that she can hit on the girl for me. That I, All right, man. so for people watching that are like, yo, I got a girl. 
I'm trying to get a threesome off. What's the strategy? How do you even go about navigating this conversation? Man, I feel like I don't know if this is going to be the thing that makes it happen, but you just got to be honest and just be like, yo, this is what I want to do. Like, I feel like a lot of guys are in relationships where they can't even tell the girl that they're dating that they find another girl attractive. And I think that's one of the big reasons why I'm able to be with Lena that I wouldn't be able to necessarily be is with. Is it Lena? I've been saying like Lena. Every, Lena? Everybody on earth, but yes, Lena. Everybody. You guys just be able to be honest and just say, yo, this is like, a lot of guys can't even say like, yo, that girl's hot. Like me and my girl are hanging out and we see a bad chick walking by. I don't got to pretend that I don't see it. I'd be like, damn, check her out. You know, it's like, you got to be able to have that relationship where you can just be super honest about that shit from the beginning and to be honest me and her kind of started dating and like from day one i was like yo let me fuck you and your roommate together so i like his style <laughs> we never bro. really had to get over the hump i was just real about it i'm like yeah. yo your roommate got a fat ass we should we should all fuck and then like she just made it happen and then is there rules like to threesomes or, or is it just like whatever kind of happens happens or is it like a, a playbook like yo you can't do this I don't think- look her in the eyes when you're She's pretty cool about it, to be real. Like, she ain't really, like, worried about me, like, having feelings for the other girl or whatever. But I would say that that's definitely, like, what you need to be on top of is, like, you got to definitely, like, divvy up the fucking, like, at least, like, 50% plus to your girl. You know? <laughs> yeah, you might right. even want to do a healthy 60-40 type 40, shit, you know? Right, it's like, right. you definitely just want to show her 50, more 50 attention. 50-50 gets a little, like... You know, 50-50, <laughs> she could kind of take it the wrong way, okay. yeah. <laughs> you got to just try to, like, focus on her as much as possible and make her, mm. let her know that... This is a way of you tightening your bond or like going mm. through. That's that's like why I always been into this. That's good game shit, right shit there. Is that it's like I always felt like I would do that with a girl, and then we would be way tighter after because we just had like a crazy next level experience together, you know. But a lot of girls probably just ain't into it, and I don't know. I mean, maybe she just ain't the one for you if you really like are dying to do that, you know. Yeah, I hope I just got somebody a threesome by asking this question. Make sure y'all. Right, hashtag, I got a threesome if, if this is you in the comment section. <laughs> but how do you, so even when you're dealing with like other girls, just being that you, you know, you, you've developed some notoriety, people like understand like, you know, they know your face, they know you're out here, they know what you do. Um, is there ever like hesitation on dealing with new girls in that space just because you don't know, you know, mm. what they, what they want to do, ulterior motives and how they maneuver? Yeah, because to be real, at this point, I feel like me and her almost like exclusively hook up with girls that are porn stars or private snap girls or strippers or just chicks who are like cool with that shit because when you're dealing with like a fan it can be kind of weird because like you know they're just not accustomed to this they're not used to it they might start acting funny and trying to snapchat or just being weird about it or whatever and when you deal with girls that like are professional with it then it's kind of different you know i mean i'm open to fielding all offers but i mean (laughs) shit like it just feels like a lot of the times, like, you're better off dealing with a girl that has done this before. <laughs> because yeah. you don't want to, like, be the first one doing it because they might just be weird. No, nah, for sure. All right, just, like, switching gears. With, when we're talking about, like, just you with this brand that you've been able to cultivate and build and actually monetizing it, right? Like, obviously, like, YouTube's a big platform. Mm. I always see, like, in the beginning of your interviews, you're like, yo, YouTube demonetized us, mm. blah, blah, blah. When we're talking about just kind of creating avenues... And I'm not like trying to like pocket watch you or nothing like that. But like when we talk about creating avenues to monetize the brand, how do you see that? Like what's your mind frame just on on that? (coughs) I mean, my attitude, to be honest, is you're never going to make an insane amount of money doing YouTube interviews. But, you know, we can do that and we can sell T-shirts and we can do live streams and we can sell weed, no jumper branded weed in store soon. Ask your local dispensary if you're out in California or beyond. Um, you know, it's like, to me, it's like the content is the basis of the business. And then from there, it's like, we're going to sell kandamas, which is the ball and stick toy that everybody sees me playing What the fuck is that, bro? It's a 17th century Japanese skill toy. That's really fun. (laughs) Pick one up at nojumper.com. Yo, hold up, but hold up. I'm sorry to even change gears. I got to know about that shit because I watch you doing it all the time. Yeah. Um, what the fuck is it? It's basically just like, it's spelled K-E-N-D-A-M-A. And it's just like this Japanese toy that at some point around 10 years ago, a bunch of different dudes ended up discovering it who are like snowboarders, I think, and rollerbladers and shit like that. Basically just a bunch of white people who went to Japan took this traditional Japanese toy and just started playing with it. And then it's become this like bizarre, super in-depth subculture of people who are like 
totally passionate about this thing and it spreads like a fucking disease because I just have a friend named Reed Stark who got me into it yeah. and then I just got into it and then all of a sudden I was making them and selling them under the No Jumper name and stuff which is probably the most random monetization <laughs> scheme that I yeah. could ever imagine having happened but yeah. I mean it just makes sense because we really are super passionate about it and it's it's just I would compare it to like a skateboard I would be a mix for like my whole life it's just like that it's just something that is totally meaningless but you can just spend hours learning to do stuff with it and even my friends who don't really fuck with it like that are like slowly getting deeper and deeper into it it's just it's like a mind virus is that the next fucking wave bro it could be. Ken, I don't, Ken, I don't know. What do you, what's it called? Kendama. Kendama. I think that if it is the next wave, then that will say very good things about today's youth because it's, it really teaches you to be a man. <laughs> Word. I feel that. Yo, just, man, lastly, what, what's next for you, man? Like I said, you, you've built this, this platform, man. You, you're doing great interviews. Um, what, what's, what's just next? How do you continuously elevate? I mean, I can only do so many interviews, so I just plan on to continue just going as hard as possible with that. And then also just, you know, pushing all the other sides of the business, just making more like vlog type content where we just go out around people's areas. We just really want to be making the best, most consistent content that we can and just sort of keeping the audience that we have fed. And then also just like building other shit on top of it, like we're doing with the weed thing. Yeah. And uh, just pushing the merch and doing these live streams. Have you ever thought about doing like a no jumper festival type shit? I thought about it, but I mean, like. I feel like there's so many goddamn festivals in LA. There is. And it's like, Rolling Loud kills it to a level that I can't even wrap my head around. The only reason I, f but I feel like festivals are more built around the brand than mm. the actual, like everyone has the same fucking artists for the most part. Mm. But all, and all those artists have like exclusivity clauses and shit like that. So it's kind of hard to book people or some stuff. Like I seen Cole Bennett from Lyrical Lemonade kill it, yeah. but he's doing it in Chicago. Right. So it's kind of like if I was going to do it, I would maybe have to like choose like a different, a different area. spot in L.A. to. But I don't know. It's a lofty goal. Yo, first person that does a festival in Alaska is going to make all the fucking bread, B. Well, they get I'm telling you right they now. They get money from the government. Shout out Andrew Yang. <laughs> you voting for him? Yeah. Thousand dollars a week or some shit like that? A month. But yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a pint a month. Right. Damn. So we lit. <laughs> it's lit, man. I don't drink lean, but I mean, I like everybody I mention it to, all my friends and stuff, they're like, damn, I could get more weed. I can get some lean. And I'm like, no, Andrew Yang would not approve of that, bro. That's not the <laughs> Doesn't message. Doesn't approve of this message. <laughs> Yo, Adam, I appreciate you pulling appreciate up on you, me, dog. G. Thank you, my dog. My man, hey, this is Adam22, No Jumper. Great episode of Cigar Talk. We out of here. Like, comment, and subscribe. All that. Cheers. Coolest podcast in the world. I was about to say that shit. Hey, it's lit. <laughs> <laughs>